Good morning. Good morning. What is happening? Man, I hope you guys are having a fantastic week as we are moving into Tuesday now. It's no longer Monday. It's Tuesday. It's the second day of the week. Monday is get ahead of the eight ball Monday, the day that you should get things moving in the right direction. And Tuesday is where you just continue to perpetuate that momentum. And as always for Tuesday training, we're here to try to give you something actionable, something you can use to put in your business, make a little more cheddar today, maybe help a few more people. And in today's case, it's kind of help you understand contracts a little bit. Um, I'm fortunate uh, that my experience in the business has allowed me to really get a thorough understanding of contracting in the senior market, whether it's Medicare supplements, Medicare Advantage, final expense, LOA, independent broker, whatever, yada, yada, yada. And I'm going to lay all of that out for you today. Uh, so for any of you guys that are hesitant about contracts, you don't really understand them and you have a lot of questions on them, this is going to be a good episode for you because I am going to break down exactly what you need to know when it comes to contracting in the senior market space, uh, more specifically the Medicare space, but we'll touch on a couple of little ancillary areas of that as well. Uh, so buckle your seatbelt for that. And in the meantime, as always, we got a wee bit of news. Uh, so let's just jump into it real quick with some news. This is some good stuff here. U.S. homeowners insurance outlook downgraded. Yikes. What does this say? Well, due to a sustained three-year period of net underwriting losses in the U.S. homeowners insurance segment, exacerbated by the rise in natural catastrophes in the first half of 2023, and coupled with persistent market challenges, AM Best has adjusted its outlook on the segment shifting it from stable to negative. So we've already seen a lot of carriers getting out of areas, right? Like State Farm pulled out of, uh, I think they pulled out of California, maybe Florida too. There's other people pulling out of Florida, pulling out of California. You got people in Texas having issues as far as insurance carriers go. Uh, so this should come as no real surprise, uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of disheartening a little bit because for the longest time, that market, and I'm not an expert in the PNC space, but that market's been really stable. Uh, and then now AM Best uh, is saying, well, the outlook is uh, negative in the uh, home insurance space. So pretty, pretty crazy there. And I don't, again, I don't understand uh, PNC well enough to kind of speculate on where that might lead us. Uh, we might, uh, if you got some comments in there, feel free to drop them on where you think we're going in the home insurance space. Uh, but it, you know, it goes on a little further. It says as detailed in the updated report from Market Segment Outlook U.S. homeowners. Insurance providers within this segment have been grappling with a series of challenges. These include a high occurrence of catastrophic events, inflation-driven pressures, and escalating reinsurance expenses. So not sure where it's headed, uh, but we will make sure this article gets posted in there. And uh, you can take a little closer look at it and see maybe, you know, what you might be looking for in the home insurance space. Uh, I am just happy that I'm in Texas and have good home insurance uh, with Progressive. And thankfully, they helped me put a new roof on recently. So let's go. Uh, moving right along, let's uh, check this out. Uh, in the ACA marketplace, enrollment is on the rise. Uh, and it says it reaches record high. Fewer people are buying individual market coverage elsewhere. They are going to the ACA marketplace. And why is that? Well, it's because subsidies are up is the big part of it, right? And uh, I was actually having this conversation with uh, with the gentleman at a car sales dealership. He was telling me how much he pays for his insurance because he goes all through his uh, group plan that he gets through his car insurance employer. He gets a pretty good rate. His wife and his kids are getting hammered on that plan. And I told him, he's like, man, you might be better off this year during open enrollment giving me a call. You keep your group plan and let me move your wife and your kids over to a good ACA plan because chances are, with uh, subsidies being at 400% of poverty level, might be able to, you know, save some money there. Because uh, that's how I did it previously when I was incorporated or employed as a W-2 person a while back. I had my own group insurance with my employer, but I had grace on an ACA plan because it just made more sense. I She got better coverage and certainly got a better rate. Uh, but going through this, it's going to tell you that in, in individual market enrollment continues to grow, again, driven by its enhanced subsidies. As early as 2023, an estimated 18.2 million people have individual market coverage, the highest since 2016. And you can actually see the graph here. It shows the ACA enrollment space. You'll see, obviously, it was down to 10 million back in 2011. Had a big spike 
in 2015 and 2016, and that dipped as rates, premiums went way up over these next few years. But then as subsidies came back in starting in 2020 and increased, now we're seeing ACA enrollment on the marketplace back up to 18.2 million and all time high. And I know a lot of my friends that are out there in the ACA space are loving it because they are making a killing uh, right in business hand over fist. So I'll make sure this article is also in the group. This is from Kaiser Family Foundation. And I've, you've, you've seen me reference Kaiser Family Foundation on the show a few times. If you're not paying attention to some of the, the news articles and the uh, and analysis that they put out, uh, white papers that they put out, you really should be. Uh, this is an excellent place to get great information in the health insurance space. Uh, but right here, figure two says almost four in five individual market enrollees are subsidized. Because remember, they're subsidizing up to 400% of poverty level now. So four out of five are getting subsidized. I mean, that just tells you how, how unfortunate uh, and poor, I guess, some of the folks are in America, that they're getting subsidized at that rate. Uh, but certainly good for them, because uh, as far as I'm concerned, they deserve it. Uh, I think we all need a raise. But great article here. I will push this out to the group and definitely check it out. Uh, but yeah, ACA enrollment is cruising up. And if you're not in the ACA space, if you're out there uh, doing something else, you might want to consider that. Moving along, you've heard me talk about the Medicare uh, Part D price negotiation, the drug negotiation that's going on. Recently, I talked about the 10 drugs that are being negotiated for price wars in uh, Medicare. Well, now they're going after Part B drugs. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Medicare, Medicare has basically two types of drugs. They have your primary ones under Part D as in drug, which are your prescription drugs, the ones you actually go and get at the pharmacy. But then they have drugs that are called Part B, B as in boy. Those are drugs that are generally administered by a doctor. Chemotherapy, steroid shots, different things like that where you're actually going in uh, to a doctor and you're getting outpatient treatment uh, through some form of drug administration, whether it be a shot or intravenous, whatever that case might be. And we are looking at 34 Medicare drugs, Part B drugs specifically, uh, that might be capped at $618 until December. And uh, that sounds like a pretty good headline. But when you look into this article a little further, what it's really telling is that some people who take Medicare Part B drugs might save up to $618 per average dose between October and December. So three months, they're getting some reprieve under the Medicare Prescription Drug Inflation Rebate Program. Part B beneficiary coinsurance may be lowered for 34 prescription drugs, which can mean a savings of anywhere from $1 to $618 per dose. And looking on a little further, there is a list of 34 drugs that is right here. Let me share this for you real quick. Oh, it doesn't want to let me share that one. Really? All right. I can't share the list with you, unfortunately. It won't click over. It doesn't have a share option. But what I will do is make sure that list is posted. Uh, but just to run a few with you, the big one that is on there uh, is Humira. Uh, that is an extremely expensive drug. It's about $7,300 for a kid of two doses. $7,300. And what they have done is they have adjusted the coinsurance amount that's normally a flat 20%. They're reducing that. It's not getting reduced a lot. And that's why they're coming up with that $618. Like Humira specifically, just to give an example, they're reducing it by 0.003%. So instead of paying the full 20% coinsurance you would for Humira uh, as a Part B drug, you're going to pay 19.997. So at $7,300 a dose, though, that's where you're getting that $618 uh, as, as far as the savings goes. So they are bringing down the cost form a little bit. But it's a little deceiving. It's still going to cost them an arm and a leg, uh, just maybe not both arms and a leg. So uh, I will get that in the group and make sure that you guys have a copy of that list if you want to check it out as well. Uh, but that is a fairly interesting one. And then moving along, boom, one of my favorite, favorite things. Bear with me a minute. I realized that I lost my screen share. Give me just a moment. Let me pull that back up because I want to talk about this one right here. And that should be on the screen now for you. Yes. Medicare Advantage enrollment and plan availability and premiums in rural areas. Now, I've been working in the Medicare space for 19 years. And typically, 
uh, when you're in urban areas, Medicare Advantage thrives. Why? Well, because there's a large group of doctors and hospitals and clinics that they can build a good supporting network around that supports that product. You get out in the very rural areas where you're not in a big city, you don't have as many doctors, you don't have as many hospitals, you don't have as many clinics and urgent care centers, et cetera. And generally speaking, Medicare Advantage has not done very well out there because they don't have a good, strong network to support it. So a lot of times when you get in the very rural areas, uh, outlying the Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, some of these super rural areas, you'll find more PPO plans, which looks great. But then again, who's actually going to accept that PPO plan? That's the next thing, because one thing that is true in Medicare, PPO plan doesn't mean you can just go anywhere, right? So if you're out there selling Medicare PPOs, be very straightforward with your clients. Just because you're on a PPO doesn't mean you can just go anywhere you want. It means you can go anywhere you want under two conditions. Number one, that provider accepts Medicare. And number two, they're willing to accept the fee schedule or the terms and conditions of that PPO plan. So anytime you have someone that's on a Medicare PPO, they always want to talk to that doctor, that provider and go, hey, you're out of network for me. So I had a couple of questions for you. Number one, do you accept Medicare? Number two, I'm on this uh, United Healthcare Advantage PPO plan, whatever it might be. Will you accept that plan for me out of network so that I only have to pay the out of network cost and not the full 100%? So what this is saying is that plan availability and premiums in rural areas are doing much better, and it's definitely grown. It's grown a lot. Uh, if you look in this article, it'll tell you that Medicare Advantage enrollment has grown rapidly in recent years. More than half of all eligible Medicare beneficiaries are in a Medicare Advantage plan. 51% of all Medicare beneficiaries are currently in a Medicare Advantage plan. Originally, that was not projected to happen until 2030, and we are seven years ahead of schedule. And it's only going to continue at that rate, especially now that rural areas are really starting to take off. So just to give you some examples, I mean, and I don't have all the stats in front of me, but as I've been looking at some of the Medicare Advantage plan rollouts, the footprint growth is amazing, especially in the dual eligible market for people that have both Medicare and Medicaid. I think Aetna picked up like 86 new counties in Texas uh, for their Medicare Advantage plan. There's only 254 counties in Texas. I say only. I mean, that's a lot of counties but they picked up 86 more counties to cover their DSNIP plans. So it's definitely growing. Uh, so it says Medicare Advantage enrollment is lower, but has grown more rapidly in recent years in rural areas than in metropolitan areas. So the rural growth is actually outpacing urban growth right now. In 2023, 40% of all beneficiaries in a rural county are now enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. That's nearly four times the share back in 2010 when we owned 11% of people. So rural Medicare Advantage enrollees can choose now among 27 plans on average, which is triple the number of plans that they had just five years ago. And in rural counties, like all areas, most Medicare Advantage enrollees are in a plan that charges no premium other than the Part B premium. And it's not uncommon that there's a give back on that that gives them a, 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 a reduction. So you, now you got 40% of Medicare beneficiaries that live in rural areas on Medicare Advantage plan. That is huge growth. And if you come and you look back here at some of these graphs, it'll tell you pretty quick, right? Metropolitan is green, micropolitan is orange, and rural is blue. Back in 2010, only 11% of them. You look now, boom, 13 years later, they're at 40%. That's a tremendous growth. In 2023, more than 1.8 million Medicare beneficiaries in rural areas are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plan. And again, that is more than four times the number. So you can see what some of the average county, this is the number of average plans in a county. So for example, in rural areas, back in 2010, MA took kind of a pop and had a big spike, but then it immediately peeled back and you see that it kind of rolled down. So like 2015, 2016, they only had about eight plans to choose from. Now they've got an average 27 plans to pick from in different rural areas. So it is definitely growing. So uh, if you're out there in the Medicare space and you're not fooling around with Medicare Advantage plans, maybe it's time you start because it is becoming more and more popular. Just two years ago, uh, the average stat for the uh, turning 65-year-old, the person that's brand new to Medicare, they were choosing Medicare Advantage plan in a four to five rate. So out of every five of them that were new to Medicare, four of them were enrolling in an MA plan and the other one was either A, keeping original Medicare or B, buying a supplement. 
So I'll get this in the group as well. Again, another great article by Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, and if you're not on that Medicare train, maybe it's time to get it. I mean, and let's go back and look at this real quick. Let's just talk about this. Let's just hit the nail on the head real fast, right? I already showed you this one. So if you're in the homeowner's insurance space, outlook negative, maybe you consider a pivot to the Medicare Advantage space where outlook is very positive. So anyway, moving along, I wanted to talk to you guys about contracting today. First and foremost, if you have any questions on contracts, Drop them in the drop them in the chat box down there. Drop them in the comments. Let me let you know. And for this little Facebook user anonymous person here, uh, yes, these videos are available on YouTube. And if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, what is the problem? It's right over there. It's just on YouTube. You just go over the YouTube. You search Insurance Syndicate. You find the channel and you hit the subscribe button. It's just that easy. And then you can always come back and replay and watch any of these videos that you want to. <clears throat> so be sure and subscribe. Uh, I had a visitor back there looking through my door and threw me off for a second. So pardon the uh, the hiccup in my cadence. Um, yeah, just looking through some comments. That's pretty much it for the most part. But hey, if you got questions on contracts, drop them in there because I'm going to give you the full rundown of what contracting is like in the senior market, primarily in the Medicare space, right? Because uh, final expense is actually pretty simple. I don't know anything about contracting in the property and casualty world, so most of this won't apply. I don't really know a whole lot. Not really true about the ACA space. ACA is kind of easy. It's all single payer, uh, but there are different contracts that you want to look out for there. So with the Medicare market, right, the senior market, and I'm going to be talking about Medicare supplement plans, Medicare Advantage plans, hospital indemnity plans, cancer products, short-term care, uh, home health care, all of those products, even final expense, even annuities, technically, all of those products that fit to the senior demographic, contracting in that world is a lot different than it is in property and casualty. It's a lot different than it is in ACA. And in some cases, it's a lot different than it is in, in areas of the life insurance space. And I never knew that until I started hanging out with people that, that worked in other product lines like property and casualty. And I realized that, wow, contracting over here is a heck of a lot different than it is in my world. My world is maybe more complicated from some people might look at it as more complicated because there's many more levels. There's more options with direct pays and hierarchies and LOA contracts and broker contracts and MGAs and SGAs and all of that. To me, it's a little more simplified, but that's because I was raised in it. And I said earlier, I was fortunate because my experience allowed me to spend a lot of time working in the wholesale space of Medicare. Uh, which allowed me to really get a great understanding at the, from the top level down of what contracts are like. And I was also very fortunate that my second year in insurance as a very green, wet behind the ears agent, uh, I was picked up by a mentor that really taught me contracts, helped me understand them so that I uh, really understood the marketplace. I understood how contracts work, how they get distributed, uh, what to look for in contracts, what to be aware of, et cetera, and really how to understand them. The first group that I worked with, they didn't tell me squat about contracts. They just handed me one. But here, fill that out. Now go out there and knock on doors. And I really had no clue. I'm like, yeah, sure, contract, whatever. Pay me commissions. Hopefully I make some sales. Um, let's go. But when I switched from Family Heritage to another group, uh, that guy, one of the very first things that he taught me was, here's how contracts work in the senior market. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about. So number, number one, the biggest thing to understand is there's basically two types of contracts. Right. There is the LOA, which stands for licensed only agent agreement, uh, also known as a blank agent. You may hear that called referred to as a blank agent contract. And then there is the basic broker contract. LOA is pretty simple. LOA contract means that you when you sign that contract uh, with the insurance company. Right. And I'm talking specifically first when these contracts, I'm specifically talking about contracts with the insurance carrier. Right. Not contracts you might have with a third party, but there are two types of contracts that exist with an insurance company. So if I'm going to go out and get contracted with United Healthcare or with Humana or Mutual Omaha, they have two types of contract options, LOA, license only agreement or blank agent. And then they have the broker contract for the true independent agent. What is the main difference between those two? Well, an LOA contract and I'll preface this real quick. You'll hear a lot of people on Facebook and in other groups say, don't sign an LOA contract. LOA contracts are bad. They're bad. Stay away from them. 
that is a blanket statement. That's not a great thing to say because I can tell you that there are a lot of people with LOA contracts that make a killing in this industry. And as the 15, 16 years I spent doing wholesale work in this in this market, I can tell you that the most productive teams, the most profitable teams that I ever worked with, mentored, tutored, trained, and in wholesale for, uh, they were all LOAs. Those teams were absolutely crushing it. But there is a difference. So LOA blatantly means that you, when you sign that contract with United Healthcare, Humana, Mutual Ma, whoever it is, if it's an LOA version, you are si assigning your commissions to a third party. So when you write business, that third party is the one that's getting paid from the insurance company. And then that third party pays you. Now, you'll see this exists in a couple of different ways in the senior market. One way that you'll see it is those commissions are just being assigned to a TPA. A TPA is a third party administrator. Several carriers use them. It's not uncommon. It's really common in the Medicare supplement space where you have groups that are developing products and then they're finding a TPA to pair up with that product so that they can bring it to a company and go, hey, we're developing this product. We want to put it on your paper. We've got the TPA. We have everything. We'll manage it. We'll run the commissions. We'll do the whole bit. Right. So just because your commissions are assigned doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Again, that's all going to depend on the nature of a second piece that I'm going to get to in a minute. But again, when you sign an LOA contract, you're assigning those commissions to a third party that will then administer those commissions and pay you. Now, typically, not always, but typically when you sign an LOA contract with an insurance carrier, your broker that you're getting that contract from is going to have a side contract, the contract that exists between you and him. And that is going to dictate how that money is paid to you. OK, the contract you're signing with the insurance carrier is an LOA. All that's doing is getting you appointed, verifying you have a license, running your background check and getting you contracted so that you have an agent number to go write business. The secondary contract, the one you have with your broker, that's going to determine actually how it pays. What are your commissions? What are your advance modes? What is the vesting clause if there even is one? What are the release policies in there in case you decide to move away from that brokerage later, right? So anytime you're signing an LOA agreement, the contract with the insurance carrier is it's a blank agent contract. It's simple. It's like, hey, we're just going to get you appointed, but your broker or your this TPA is the one that's handling the commissions. So then you want to look at the secondary contract and go, that's the real stuff. That's the real meat and potatoes that I need to be paying attention to to make sure this is the right agreement for me, right? And every broker, every upline that you receive an LOA agreement from with the carrier, they're all going to have their own little contracts that are different. Some are going to be better than others, right? Some might give you no vesting. Some might give you really crappy commissions. Some may give you better, et cetera. So those are things that you're going to weigh. And the primary things, in my opinion, that you should look for is number one, right off the top, what are my commissions, right? What are my requirements as an agent in that LOA agreement with you? What are your requirements as my broker? Like, what are you bringing to the table? that is listed in that contract that I can count on you for. What are in my advance modes? Is there a vesting period? What does that look like? And then more importantly, what does a release look like on the back end, right? If I want to get out of that contract or I want to move it, what does that process look like? Those are the primary things you really want to look for when you're signing an LOA agreement that has a secondary contract with a broker that's handling those commissions and that business for you. Because then for all intents and purposes, that broker owns the business when you sign an LOA agreement, right? So if you sign an LOA contract with United Healthcare under a broker, let's just say you sign one with me and I don't deal in, in LOA contracts too much, really, except for my in-house guys right here. Uh, the brokers that I work with are all on direct, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But if you sign an LOA contract with me, for example, then you want to talk to me about what my process looks like should you decide to leave, right? Number one, do I have a release? Uh, et cetera, because I'm the one that technically would be owning all of that business. If you did leave, am I willing to transfer that business to you as AOR? Like those are all the little fine details that some agents will gloss over when they are looking at LOA agreements. So those are the big points, because anytime you're assigning your commissions to them, as far as that insurance carrier is concerned, that broker is the one that owns the business or at least owns the commissions. You might be listed as the writing agent of record, 
But in many times when you transfer that contract or you leave or you uh, uh, terminate it, whatever the case may be, uh, you lose access to that book of business 100 percent. It's not a hard and fast rule. But that's kind of a general rule. Right. So that's LOA agreements. And they exist in all facets of insurance. You can get LOA agreements through a broker on Medicare supplements. You can definitely get them on Medicare Advantage. And they certainly exist in the final expense world in a big way. Now, the second version of contracts that exist in this market are what are just going to be called a broker contract, right? Or an independent agent agreement, uh, also uh, known as a direct pay contract. Why would they call it that? Well, under this agreement, when you sign this contract, the insurance company pays you directly. Right. So when you sign that contract with United Healthcare and you go write business, you get a deposit from United Healthcare. Right. When you go write business with Humana, you're getting a deposit from Humana or Wellcare, whoever it might be. In that case, you own all of the business. And the great part about the majority and probably all of the independent broker contracts are out there that are direct paid, you're vested from day one. So whether you write one app or 101 apps doesn't really matter. You're going to own all the business outright from day one, period. Immediate vesting starts on these broker contracts, which is a huge advantage, assuming some other things that, again, I'll dive into in a minute, basically meaning that you have the ability to really fill out uh, the work that is necessary under an independent broker contract. Because one thing that's very true in the LOA space, you should be getting a lot of support from that broker. If you're assigning your commissions to them, they're likely giving you leads or some kind of lead co-ops, right? They might be providing you CRMs, technologies, tools, et cetera. Like in my LOA agreement that I have with my team, they get everything. They get free leads. They get all the training. They get all the CRMs. They get all the tools they need. All they have to do is sit down, look at their appointment calendar, write business, right? Now, on the broker side, none of that exists for the most part. Yeah, they might have some tools here, depending on the FMO or broker that you're going through. But generally speaking, the majority of your expense as an agent is going to be on you, right? You still might be able to get marketing co-ops if you're on a broker agreement, again, depending on the FMO or broker you're working through. But the majority of your business, the majority of your responsibilities and your expenses are going to fall on you as the independent agent. Why? Well, you're getting the full rip on the commission, number one. You're not giving up some of the commission through an LOA agreement where you're getting more support on the back end. You're responsible for yourself. So you're going to buy your own CRM most of the time, right? You got to buy your own phone system most of the time. You got to buy your own leads or create your own marketing plan. But you're the one in control. This is your business. And this is when I learned this, because when I came into the business, I was on an LOA agreement, had no clue what it even was. And it wasn't until I, I moved into the Medicare space and met a proper mentor that taught me contracts. And when I found out that there are broker agreements that allow me to get direct paid and own my business from day one was the day that my head exploded. And I realized that insurance is truly a business opportunity that I can grow my own business, my own practice and build a passive residual income that I am fully in charge of. A lot of agents don't quite grasp that, especially the newer ones. And even some of the veteran agents I've seen out there, they don't seem to grasp that. Hey, this is actually a business. This ain't a job, right? This is a business opportunity when you get in this side of the business where you're working with broker agreements that are direct paid, where you own the business and you're fully vested. So most of the broker agreements that you'll see with carriers, they're all pretty much boilerplate, I would say. There are a few little caveats that you want to look for in there. Um, first big one that you generally want to look for, obviously, is what is your commission level that you're getting on that contract? How much am I getting paid? In the Medicare Advantage world, some of that is standardized, and I am going to go through those different levels for you in a minute because I want you to get an understanding of what is available and also want you to understand what people are making off of you. If you don't already know that, you should know that. I think it's important as an agent that if you are working under an upline, it's good for not only you to understand what you're getting paid, but what that guy's getting paid on your business as well. And we're going to jump into that as well. Um, but most of the broker agreements are pretty boilerplate. First thing you want to look for is number one, what am I getting paid? What is my commission? Whether it's percentage, flat dollar amount, how does that work? What are, uh, the, the other big thing, and this is in the vesting side. Now, most of them are going to tell you that you're vested from day one, but some of them will tell you, well, you're only vested if your renewals stay at a certain threshold. Cigna does this on their contracts. I don't know if they still do it on their old MedSup contract. I know they used to, where if you didn't have, I think it was $600 a year in commissions, 
which is the minimum threshold to be reported to the IRS for 1099 income anyway, um, they weren't even going to pay them anymore. They're going to tell you, no, you're out, right? So a lot of them will have a threshold of, hey, if your commission, your annual commissions fall below 600 bucks, you're no longer invested. And let's be honest, that shouldn't be a negative because if you're not making more than $600 in this business a year anyway on a contract, maybe, maybe, maybe this isn't for you. I don't know. You know, so something to think about. But look for that threshold. Look to see, hey, do you have a minimum annual commission volume for me to maintain my vesting and maintain my renewals? Because that can be important to you in a lot of cases. And some, it may very well be higher than 600 bucks. You know, it's usually not, but look into that. Uh, the other big thing to look for is appointment fees. Are you charging me the appointment fees? A lot of the broker contracts, the carrier requires you to pay your own appointment fees. Not all of them. Most of them, truthfully, you're going to pay them for you. Right. The majority of the carriers I work with about 42 different carriers in the Medicare space. Uh, I think all but maybe four of them actually pay my appointment fees for me, which is awesome. Great deal. Right. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what's an appointment fee, if you haven't had to pay one yet, maybe you're in Arizona, South Carolina, Colorado, or Illinois, where there are no appointment fees. But basically, anytime the insurance company files a state appointment for you so that you can be authorized to sell in that state. The uh, state pushes an appointment fee to that insurance company, right? So the company's paying it. But most of those, a lot of some carriers will push that to you. And they'll say, no, 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 no. I'm not paying this guy's appointment fees. I don't even know if he's going to produce. Why do I want to go spend my money paying appointment fees on a guy that I don't know if he's even going to produce it? So a lot of them uh, will push that through to you. A couple of notable ones are United Healthcare, uh, Anthem makes you pay your own appointment fees. Uh, there are definitely some other ones out there. United Healthcare is the big one in the Medicare broker space that, that charges appointment fees. And the reason they're problematic on their appointment fees is because they have multiple entities at every state. So when you go and you get licensed in, say, Texas with United Healthcare on the Medicare side, you're not just getting one entity licensed on your license. You're not just going to appoint one entity. You're going to appoint about four. So instead of it being a $10 fee in Texas, you end up having to pay 40 right? Not a big deal in Texas. But then go to uh, Kentucky, where appointment fees are $60 per entity. And that includes, if you're a corporation, it doubles that because you're having to get $60 for your individual, $60 for your corp, and, and so forth. And if, and if United Healthcare, I think, has four entities in Kentucky, you're looking at about uh, $480 in appointment fees. So it can get pretty expensive. That's one other thing to look for when you're looking at contracts and say, hey, who's paying the appointment fees on this deal? And then also how are appointments run? Most of the companies now, especially in uh, states or product lines where they're allowed to, they will do an appointment on or they'll run what they call just in time appointments, which means they won't actually file it with the state until you actually write business in the state and prove you're going to make money. And this is really true for the carriers that will pay your appointment fees for you. But they don't want to go pay your appointment fees if they don't know you're going to write business. So most of them will they'll get you contracted, they'll get you approved in your resident state. And then you go in your right business and say South Carolina, where you have a license, then they'll file that appointment and pay the necessary fee. South Carolina is a bad example because there is no appointment fee. But in other states, that would be the situation, right? They're going to wait until you actually prove that you're making money for them. And then they'll file that appointment fee, which sometimes causes a slight delay in business when you're writing new business in that state for the very first time, right? So that's the basics of the two primary agreements, right? LOA, you're writing business, your commissions are assigned to a third party. You want to really examine that secondary contract to make sure you understand how those commissions work, what the vesting clause is, what the release uh, policy looks like, things of that nature. And then the broker agreement world, right, where commissions are now paid direct to you. You just want to confirm how much I'm getting paid, who's paying the appointment fees, et cetera. And is there any kind of weird vesting thing in there that I have to keep and maintain a certain threshold of renewals to maintain my vesting? couple of other things to pay attention to in the broker world. <clears throat> when you're talking to any broker or FMO that you're getting that direct pay contract from, ask them what their release policy is too. And the reason why is because every insurance carrier out there uh, will protect that broker when they contract you. <clears throat> Right. So, for example, if I go sign, <clears throat> pardon me, a United Healthcare contract with ABC FMO today, 
then United Healthcare is going to uh, assign me to that FMO, so to speak, and tell that FMO that, hey, they're going to protect that FMO because their mind, they're spending money, they're recruiting an agent, right? They're doing all these things to bring that agent in. It's not fair to the broker that's doing the recruiting and going to the expense of bringing that agent under their wing to then uh, train that broker, get them up to speed. And then all of a sudden that broker can just transfer his contract and move away somewhere. Right. Especially if that broker happened to, or that agent happened to generate debt underneath them. So every insurance company out there generally has uh, some type of protection for the upline broker or the FMO that provided you that contract. It's generally six months and that's not a hard and fast rule, but I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Mutual of Omaha, co- carrier that I love, great company. They have a six month protection clause in their contracts which basically means that if you as an agent go sign a mutual model contract with ABC broker and you decide you want to move it, mutual Omaha will not let you move that contract for a period of six months from the last time you wrote business. The only way you can move it is if that upline broker agrees to release you and they sign off on a transfer form. Alternatively, you can not write business for six months and then you can transfer your mutual Omaha on your own without a signature, but not writing business for six months doesn't always sound like a great idea because that means you're not making money and you either have to find alternate products to shift to, right? So sometimes you're going to have to go back and get that release. In the Medicare Advantage world, it's a little different, but it's still similar. There's still a lot of three and six months waiting periods on transfers. The only other major difference is most of the Medicare Advantage carriers will provide a self-release option which means that if that upline or broker won't release you, then you can initiate a self-release option that generally comes with a 90-day to 180-day wait period, which means that, hey, we get it. You want to move your contract over there. That's fine, but that dude won't release you. So no problem. Submit your intent. We'll timestamp it today, and then the clock starts. And then 90 days later, you can transfer it or 180 days later, you can transfer it on your own signature, regardless of the release. That allows you to keep writing business, keep getting paid, and just prepare yourself. Now, that keep getting paid, again, kind of depends on the agreement that you have in place. You know, If you're under an LOA agreement somewhere and you're like, well, I want to transfer it, and you go through the the, uh, self-release process, well, that broker is going to find out that you submitted your contract for a self-release process. So, if it's an LOA type agreement or it's an employer type agreement, as soon as he finds that out, he might just terminate you and let you go. And then you don't even have that option of making money. So those are all things that you want to investigate as well. Pretty simple. Um, but now looking at levels, right? Looking at levels in the space. And this is where I really wanted to kind of get into some stuff. A lot of people don't really understand the hierarchy and nature of things. Insurance is, for all intents and purposes, it's a multi-level marketing game. A lot of you might agree with or disagree with me, but it is. It's it's such a great multi-level marketing industry that we have to get licensed to do it. But every direct pay contract in the Medicare space has a structured hierarchy of levels. It has multiple levels. It's multi-level marketing. Like there's no sense in arguing semantics on it. Insurance is multi-level marketing. So every contract is going to have different levels in the hierarchy from the top all the way down. And you can think of it a lot like a supply chain. It's it's pretty much just like a supply chain. So for example, if you're a manufacturer and you create a widget, you're not into sales, you're into product creation. You're not into marketing, you're into product creation. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your widget and you're going to find a national or maybe global distributor at the top level that you can give your widget to because they have all the marketing and the distribution arms to get it out there. That national guy is going to hand it to a regional guy and he's going to distribute it. And that regional guy is going to hand it to a state guy and that state guy is going to distribute all the way down. Every way along the mark, everybody's getting a little piece of the action, right? So that manufacturer might sell it to the global guy for a dollar. The global guy selling it to the regional guy for two dollars. And you, and you kind of see the hierarchy nature of it. Insurance is the same way. The only difference is we're not selling a tangible product that comes with a physical price in that aspect. We're selling paper, right, and perpetu- and perpetuity and premium. So it's a little different. The hierarchy nature is everybody's getting a little shave off the premium. So at the top level, you have the wholesale group. 
right? Those are your, what they would generally refer to, at least in the Medicare world, as your NMO. N is in national, M is in marketing, O is in organization. So when I was with Precision Senior Marketing, we were an NMO, a national marketing organization. That means that we are generally the company that's direct to the carrier at the highest contract level. We're at the wholesale level, right? So we're getting the biggest rip on the uh, commission, period, right? And I'll give you an example. Let's let's just talk about uh, Medicare supplement commissions for a second. The, in Texas, the average Medicare supplement commission is 20%. There are a few carriers that are going to pay you 18% of the premium. Some might even pay, only pay you 15 pretty rare. And some will pay you around 22%. And that's based on standard agent street level. If I'm just a regular Joe agent, I don't have any history, I don't have any reputation, and I want to go get a Medicare supplement contract, I'm probably going to find something right around 20%. Well, the guy that's at the wholesale level probably has it for 26%, 25%, right? So when he if he writes business, he's going to get paid 25%. But more importantly, he can recruit you at 20%. And he's making a 5% override in your business or a 6% override. Or sh There's even 27% Mets up contracts out there right now. 27 and a half even at NMO levels, right? So they're going to make somewhere between a five to maybe six or seven point spread on your business when you write it. Pretty important to know that. Now, between you at 20% and that NMO at 27%, there are single point increment levels all the way down. So you might have an NMO level that's the top guy, the top dog that has the exclusive distribution contract. And then maybe there's an SFMO or FMO level, right, for field marketing organization or SFMO, which is, I guess, super field marketing organization. Then you have SGA for super general agent, right? They'll have all these different levels and they're not all going to follow standardized acronyms. So when you when you go get contracted with Medicare supplements, don't think that they're all going to go by, oh, it's NMO and SFMO and SGA. And no, 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 no. They might just call it level nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Or they might come up with some other weird jargon. Doesn't matter. Just know that, hey, there's a hierarchical structure. If I'm coming at 20, depending on who I'm getting that contract from, their spread is going to be anywhere from one point to maybe as high as six points on me. That's important for important for a couple of reasons. One, it's good to know what someone's making off of you because then you can kind of understand what support you might be able to expect from them. If I'm getting my contract from a guy that's only making one point off of me, there's not much that dude can really afford to provide me. He's only getting 1%. So when you write an app, like he's going to make maybe $15 in commission on that app for the year, he's not killing it off of you. So like, don't get offended when you find out someone's making one point on you, unless it's creating other problems, which I'm going to talk about when it comes to hierarchies. But understand like, hey, this guy's only getting one point. Like, how much can I really ask of this person when it comes to like marketing co-ops or support? Like the, at most, they should probably be there to just answer questions for you, give you some good guidance and some tutoring and help point in the right direction. But that's about it. Like if the guy's only getting one point on you, you shouldn't be asking him for marketing co-ops. That's that's bullshit. Just going to be honest with you. Right. However, if they're making six or seven points on you, now maybe marketing co-ops is a little more makes sense. Right. So that's where understanding what spread someone's making on you really comes into play, because if they're making a big spread on you, it definitely pays because you can come back and go, look, man, I know you're making seven points on my business or six points on my business or five points. You know, what can you do for me to help me write more business? Do you have some marketing money? Right. Or if I write enough business, can you move my contract level up? And that's the other reason that it's extremely important to understand the hierarchical nature of contracts. Because if you as an agent go get your contract from the NMO, granted, yeah, they're making five, six, seven points on your spread, but then there's nobody in the middle that's clogging up your ability to grow your contract. So if you go out there and you write a ton of business, you can go back to that NMO and go, hey, I've been at 20 for a while. I just wrote you 500K in business this year on this product. You know, what do I got to do to get some more points? And you don't have to write 500K. Usually if you can write about $100,000 in annual premium on MedSup, you should be able to get at least an extra point uh, on your contract. Million dollars is usually the top level, right? But understanding that, hey, if, if I'm contracting direct with the NMO, that's direct to the, the insurance company that has the national distributorship, then there's nobody in between me and that NMO that's clogging up the hierarchy. 
So if I grow my business, I can move up in levels, which number one, makes me more profitable when I write business. Number two, it gives me uh, a better ability to maybe grow my team and recruit agents and grow it even bigger so that I can move my contract up even further. Now, in the Medicare supplement world, gaining those higher level contracts is all about production. The more business you write, the bigger contracts you can acquire. They don't care how many agents you have in your team for the most part. If you're in the Medicare supplement world, if you're a million dollar producer and you're all by yourself, you're probably getting the very top contract that's available, right? If you have a hundred producers and you're writing a million dollars, same thing. They're going to base it just off of the annual premium that you're writing, not so much how many people you're recruiting. Now, on the flip side, if you're the street level agent guy and you go get your 20 point med sub contract from a guy that's at 21, then you don't have anywhere to grow. You're going to be at 20 forever as long as you're underneath that guy. Because the only way you can grow your contract is if he grows his contract and then now he moves up to 22 and then he can bring you up to 21. Or he moves up to 23 and he can bring you up to 22. I hope that makes sense. But understanding that hierarchy of nature and where you fall in that hierarchy is going to make uh, is going to be extremely helpful to you to understand what are what is my latter opportunity. So I've always been of the opinion that if you truly have what it takes to be an independent business owner in the insurance world, at least in the Medicare market, you should almost always be getting your contracts from the highest possible level that you can find them. Not necessarily the highest level for you. I mean, you want to maximize your commission levels depending on your production, but you want to try to buy your contract level up to create a, 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 a space for you to grow into, right? If you're always going to get, if you're an agent, and you're always getting your contract from a GA, hopefully that guy's taking good care of you. But just because he's a nice guy doesn't always mean that it's the right decision for you. It's just show business that ain't show friends. So understanding that, hey, if I'm going to grow my business, I want the biggest possible opportunity I can get. So I'm going to find someone that's at the top level or very close to the top level that is going to give me a good enough value of support that I can get a good commission. And then as I grow my business, I can move up and be more profitable, right? So again, in the Medicare supplement world, it's all about percentages. And most of those levels are in single point increments. And it's going to vary by carrier. They're not standardized. One carrier might pay you 22 at street level. Another one might pay you 20. Their top contract might be 27 or 25. And some of them will even have sub levels below that. Right? Pretty straightforward there. Hospital indemnity, cancer insurance, final expense, those all pretty much follow in those same guidelines. Final expense is the same deal, right? As an independent broker agent, you can go out and get a 100 to 115% contract pretty easily. It's not that hard doesn't mean it's going to come with any business because that's up to you if you're a truly independent agent. So you'll see contracts in the final expense world all the way down to 40%, as high as 145 or 150%, right? Those guys that are at the 150 and the 155 point contracts, that's your national NMO that's direct to the carrier. And then all of the sub levels, they're usually in five point increments all the way down to your street level. And again, all the same concepts apply. The more premium you're right, the higher contract you can get. What level in the hierarchy are you contracting at? Am I clogged underneath someone that's preventing me from growing? Or do I have the space to write more business and get another five points or get another 10 points and grow my business, right? So in all of the product lines that kind of revolve around a percentage of premium, Medicare supplement, hospital indemnity, critical illness, short-term care, et cetera, final expense, even annuities, they've all got that kind of structure where it's going to be different percentage points as you move up the hierarchy. Medicare Advantage structure is similar, but the price points are all different and there's a limited number of levels. They don't have as much money and as much spread to create as many levels. Like there are final expense contracts out there that have 25 different commission levels built into the structure. There are Medicare supplement contracts out there that have 12 uh, levels built into the structure. Medicare Advantage, eh, you got about four or five levels to play with and that's it. After that, it's over. There is no more, right? There's no more sub levels. There's no more uh, top end levels. That's it. The only way you can create additional levels in there is to create an LOA contract and create your own little structures under the LOA agreement, which a lot of brokers do. So here's how it works in the MA space, right? We know that number one, hopefully, you know, if you're in the Medicare world, that in the Medicare Advantage world, 
Commissions are standardized by CMS, right? This year, 2023, uh, for any carrier, I don't care who it is, uh, you as an agent would get paid $601 per app for brand new to Medicare people, right? Because their very first time in a Medicare Advantage plan or their very first time on a prescription drug plan, you're going to get what the CMS calls the true up commission, which is a full amount. I call it double sugar because the replacement rate is half of that, right? So you'll get 601 for someone that's brand new to Medicare. When you make a Medicare Advantage sale, you get 301 on the replacement or the renewals. And the good news is Medicare Advantage renewals are for the life of the business. So if you keep them on the books, then you're going to keep getting paid. But how do you get the bigger contracts? Well, in the Medicare Advantage world, it's all about recruiting. Medicare supplement world, final expense world, all those other percentage point contracts, it's all based on production. The more production you write, bigger the contracts you're going to get. Medicare Advantage world, it's not as much about production. Production's about how you get your co-op monies, but it's not about how big your contract is. Because CMS states very clearly that a writing agent can only make 601-301 on a Medicare Advantage sale. It's going up next year to 311 I mean, 611, 306, if I remember correctly, maybe 305, but I think it's 306. So we are getting a little raise next year. But CMS dictates that a writing agent can make no more than 601 on new to Medicare, 301 on replacement, period. They don't care at what level you're at. I can be an NMO level, but I go write my personal business. I'm only getting 601, right? So CMS dictates those levels. Um, they What they don't dictate is the full uh, NMO level. The carrier will come inside and do that. So Medicare will come in and say, hey, the most you can pay a writing agent is 601. What y'all want to do beyond that is up to you. But then they have MLR ratios that they have to maintain, medical loss ratios, which is going to dictate kind of how they build out their hierarchy. But the majority of your Medicare Advantage carriers have about five levels. And then that will vary. It's not, again, not hard and fast. Some carriers have a few more. Uh, WellCare, I think, has a couple of more levels that most other companies don't. But in general, for you as the agent, you're still going to have that NMO that's direct to the carrier, right? So whoever is at the top of the food chain, they're at the NMO level. Then there's usually the FMO level. And these are a little closer to standardized in the Medicare world, not perfectly, or in the Medicare Advantage world. Uh, it's usually an FMO level. There's usually an SGA level, uh, uh, MGA level, managing general agent, then general agent, and then agent. That's it. Those are your levels, period. There are a couple that have some SFMO and a couple of top end levels that aren't really shown in the hierarchy, and they're based on that agent, what he's really done with that carrier, if he can obtain those. Now, growing your contract in the Medicare Advantage space, like I said, it's based on recruitment, right? And there will be standardized levels or standardized, uh, not standardized, there will be carrier requirements on what they want your recruiting numbers to look like before that broker can authorize you to get that contract. And again, not a hard and fast rule. So it's going to vary from one carrier to the next. But I will tell you this, and this is a common myth in the insurance space. I was on a podcast with Christian Brindle maybe a year or two ago when we were talking about this that you will find a lot of brokers and FMOs that will tell you that the only way that you can move from agent level in the Medicare Advantage world to general agent level, the next level up, where you're getting about a $50 override over street. So I hope I'll, I'll say that again, right? And I'll, and I'll repeat the whole thing. At agent, you're getting 601, 301. At GA, you're getting 651, 351, right? So if someone is at GA and they contract you, they're making a $50 override every time you write an app. Fairly simple. Now, a lot of brokers in, that are out there in FMOs will tell you that the only way that you can move from agent to general agent is by recruiting five people in your downline. That's a lie. It's not true. And they'll tell you it's the carrier every time. They'll tell you, no, carrier requirement, you got to have five agents to be a before you get the general agent. That is flat out lying. And I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. I'll let the, the brokers out there do it themselves. But that is a lie. They are pinning that on the carrier as a carrier requirement. And it is not a carrier requirement. No carrier out there requires you to have five downline agents to be a general agent. 
five agents is the benchmark. It's the yardstick. It's what they want you to have. But the truth is, you can have one agent in your downline and be a general agent on every single Medicare Advantage carrier that's out there. In the broker side, I should say. There, there are definitely some exceptions, right? You're going to have a tough time getting a GA contract with Blue Cross if you only have one agent. You're going to have a tough time getting a GA contract with Anthem if you only have one agent. And some of that will depend on maybe the broker of choice that you're working on. But all of your big flagship carriers that most people are selling in the Medicare Advantage world, your United Health Cares, your Aetnas, your Humanas, your Well Cares, et cetera, as long as you have one ready to sell active downline, you can move up the GA. And now you can earn $50 on their business as an override. Pretty simple. Next level up is MGA. Now, MGA, there are going to be some particulars, and this isn't going to just be broker enforced. Carriers are going to start looking at contracts or have been starting looking at contracts when they're at MGA level. Average, and again, it's going to vary by carrier. I think WellCare is the lowest. I think you only need about five agents. WellCare will let you be at MGA, right? UHC, United Healthcare, they want to see you at 10. Humana is around that 10 mark too. They kind of want to see you at 10. Um, SGA, if there's an SGA level built in, that's usually when you're looking at minimum 10, but you're looking more in the 15 to 20 agent mark. And then to get the top level, FMO level with most of the Medicare Advantage carriers, uh, you're looking at around 25 plus agents. And that doesn't just mean, hey, I got 25 agents that have filled out a contract. I got 25 agents that have contracted, completed certifications, and are ready to sell. Right. And if you have that, you can generally obtain that level. And as long as you keep around that threshold of agents, it's very rare that they'll bump you down unless you're just flat out not writing business. And then they might come back around and go, look, man, we appreciate you got 25 agents, but you guys wrote three apps last year. There's no reason for you to be at FMO level. We're moving you down. Right. But fairly rare. The only big outlier in the Medicare Advantage world that doesn't pretty much follow that structure is Aetna Medicare Advantage. They're hyper strict on their agent counts. So you can still get, and they don't call it GA, they call it LMO. You can still get that GA level one above street where you're making and that actually pays you more. They pay you $60, as I remember, on the override. Um, again, you only need one ready-to-sell agent. But if you want to move up to their next level, their MJ, they want 25 ready-to-sell agents. If you want to move up again, they want 100 ready-to-sell agents. Oh, you want the top contract with Aetna? You're looking at like 500 to 1,000 agents to even think about getting close to it. So Aetna's hyper strict on it. But you can always at least get general agent as long as you got one ready-to-sell downline. But if you're by yourself, if you're an individual agent working all by yourself, you're always only going to get an agent level and you're going to make the full 601. So going back to, again, the hierarchical nature of it, right? I said we have agent level, we have general agent level, we have MGA, managing general agent, we have SGA, super general agent, and then we usually have FMO or field marketing organization at the top, other than the NMO that's the top level distributor, right? You're almost never getting an NMO contract, so I mean, I... I know when you were a kid, you wanted to be a rock star and you told your dad to buy you a guitar and he said, look, you're never going to be a rock star. I'm telling you right now, you're probably never going to be an NMO. It's really hard to get those contracts. But if you grow a business and you go out and write 10,000 apps a year with United Healthcare, they'll probably think about giving you one, <laughs> right? But you need some massive distribution before you're ever going to be able to get to the NMO level. But you can definitely get to an FMO level pretty easily. But what I really wanted to explain was the commission points. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close, right? You at agent level are getting 601. That GA that contracted you, he's getting $50 on top of you. The MGA, he's getting another $50, right? SGA, they're going to add another $50 or so to it until you finally get to the FMO level, right? Now, it will vary a fraction from carrier to carrier, but understanding where you're at in that hierarchical nature of things, again, is going to help you understand, hey, how much is the guy above me making on me? And then that helps me evaluate what rights I have to ask for more support, right? So again, and this is why I love advocating contracting it to the NMO level, because I know that the average NMO rip on my business is about $225. They're making about 225 bucks for every app I write. Right. I'm making 601. They're making 225, for example. 
as an agent. So if they're making 225 bucks every time I write an app, you damn well better be uh, sure that when I write a lot of business with them, I'm going to go ask for stuff. I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to ask for support. I'm going to ask for co-op dollars. Anything I can get to squeeze their, 20, their 225 to help me be a better agent and help you know them grow, help have them help me grow my business, right? Help me help you, so, so to speak. But if I know I'm contracted under a general agent who's only making $50 an app off of me, well, okay, that makes a little more context. He's not making as big a rip, so he may not have the opportunity to co-op as much stuff with me. But again, he is making 50 bucks an app. So what is he doing for me? Is he giving me some training? Is he giving me some hand-holding? Is he pointing me in the right direction? Is he taking care of me? Am I part of his team that he then goes to the NMO level to get those co-op dollars from and distributes them? Like how, how good is he being as a general agent? And then ultimately, again, like I talked about in the MedSup world, it's understanding where you're at so that you know where I can grow. If you're an agent level and you're contracted under a general agent who's only one step above you, it makes it really hard for you to go build a downline. Because in order to build a downline in the Medicare Advantage world, you need to be at general agent level, assuming you want that downline to be direct paid by the company. If you want to bring them on an LOA where they're assigning their commission to you, that's always an option, regardless of what level you're at. But if you're trying to recruit people at street level and you're at street level, it makes it impossible. And if the guy above you is at general agent level, then you have nowhere to go because you're going to run into him every time. So until he gets moved up, you can't get moved up or until you just move your contract out from underneath them and go somewhere else. So it's always important to think, hey, when someone's approaching with the contract, what level are you at and what level are you bringing me in at? Not just because I want to understand what you're making off of me, but I want to understand my growth potential, right? If all I'm doing is looking at masses of asses as I try to crawl up the ladder, that's not helping my business, right? So pretty simple. Uh, a lot of that was extemporaneous. I'm surprised we've already over an hour. So I'm going to cut it off. I want to appreciate y'all's time. I hope some of that made sense to you and helps you get a little better understanding of contracts and how they work uh, in the senior market. Uh, if you have any questions on contracting in the space, what contracts are available, what you should be looking for, maybe how I can help you, give me a holler. I'd be happy to assist. Uh, and then a couple of other things. If you'll notice in the banner below, we've got an email address for Liliana.Cabrera at VivaWorks. Uh, if you are someone that wants to get on the show, or if you're someone who knows someone who wants to get on the show, or there's someone that you want to get on the show, email her, let her know, hey, we'd like to get, you know, this guy you know, Johnny agent on the show with the Tony, you know, can you, can you hook it up and get it to work? If you have topics that you would like covered on the show, email Lily, let her know. She'll communicate with me and I'll make sure that we put that topic in that show together or we get that guest on the show, whatever it takes. Other than that, man, as always, I appreciate you guys taking time to tune in. I know I'm a touch over time, but I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, you guys being part of our group here, what we do in the syndicate. And like I said, when I opened this video up, go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. If you haven't already, just go do it. And then you can always review this material much easier than trying to find it in the Facebook group. These videos will always live in the Facebook group. They're not that hard to find, but they're a hell of a lot easier to find on YouTube. So go subscribe there. Also, if you're not following us on Instagram, get over there. Click that as well. Follow us on Instagram and even TikTok because we are pushing a lot of these out as shorts, uh, which are always great to consume and have fun with. So thank you guys again. You'll have a fantastic Tuesday. I love you all. And we'll see you next week for Tuesday training. Have an awesome one.